Welcome. Today we're going to be doing Ask Away Go. If you have any questions about music, music theory, I take you through my normal routine that I try to do all beginner students. And when I do that, it lines up perfectly that you could use your hand mechanisms, the instrument you're playing on, heck, even your voice. If you've got time to hang out with me, I'm going to jib a jab for about 45 minutes. Uh, come in and out, ask questions if you will, and then if you ask a question and I don't know the answer to it, I will find it from my teacher and get back to you. So, what I would like to do is just make sure one and get back that, to you. Oh, that's me. I would like to just make sure that we've got an understanding of what the circle fist is. The circle fist is in its entirety a way to go through all of your tones. Now, a scale is a collection of tones. There are multiple different types of scales. Some of them have five notes, some of them have six. The ones we generally know in the Western ear for our music is a seven tone scale. And it's just a composition and arrangement of tones. The way we learn them is generally in an ascending order. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. So that's the primary of what we're going to be talking about here. Last couple sessions, we talked about the circle of fifths going in fifths one way and in fourths the other. I teach the sharps, and then we go through the process of seeing them in the flats because we learn the sharps. So if you're going to watch all these, I suggest you go back to some of the first videos. However, the first thing we do is we draw the circle. Now, for those of you out there that pop on this channel that don't know what I'm doing, I'm just going to draw a circle. How do I draw a circle? Is that right? Do I know how to spell? Uh, fifths. When we do this, we're going to be going through the process of seeing these notes falling together and going around in order. The first one we talk about is C. So when we have ideas and we say there are no sharps and flats in the key of C. C has no sharps and flats. What's a sharp and a flat? Sharp and the flat are called accidentals. There are actually three of them. Now, for those of you who are under the age of 20, they're not just always called hashtags. They used to be called the pound sign. This little numerical order is going to change the value of the aforementioned notes. And a flat is kind of like the opposite or the antecedent of that. It's going to take the note and go down. So if we have an individual note right here, let's call it C, uh, and we go flat, uh, it goes down in pitch. If we were to go up in pitch, uh, uh, a half step, that's what these accidentals do. Yes, there are double sharps and double flats, but we're not going to talk about those as accidentals right now. We're just going to talk about our main three, sharps, flats, and naturals. When we play these, they alter the notes. So what we want to bear in mind is that the three of these correlate to notation. Cool. So the three concepts of these are we're going to talk about how to use them through the eyes of the circle of fifths. <laughs> now what we're about to do here is we're going to lay this out with Roman numerals. The Roman numerals themselves represent the notation of a seven note scale. In the future, we could talk about eight note scales. There are also 12 note scales. There really aren't nine to 11 note scales, but what we do is we would classify those as just extensions on scales. Now, if you're tired of me saying scales, say it with me, scales, scales. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven. Notice how the one, the four, and the five all represent majors. They have caps on the top of their Roman numerals. If you're not familiar with Roman numerals, the Greek Roman systems use different notations. So what we do is we take little bits and pieces of history that are music related and throw them into our chorale of theory. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We do have an eighth note, but that's the same. Some people might have heard of something called the solo fet. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. That's what we're talking about here. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Do. The one and the eight are the same, so we just talk about that in being fashion of an octave. There are intervals between here. In the key of C, when we use this circle of fifths, we can take all the notes aforementioned that have no sharps and flats, the C, the D, the E, the F, the G, the A, and then the B, and we could give them seniority, meaning C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, 
A minor, B diminished. Each one of these has a very special function as the role in the note in that scale aforementioned. When we talk about this diatonic scale, we are talking about the one and the six having the same key signature. So if we were to see a treble clef or a bass clef, depending on actually any clef, <laughs> on a staff, and we were to notice that, let's say we're in the treble clef, reason why we have treble clef on this line is when you take the treble clef and you remove the top half, it signifies that we are in this key. This is the G clef. So that gives us an orientation on how to read music in notation. When we see a C, middle C is located on the ledger line below the treble clef. When we go up in nature, we go in half steps or minor seconds. The interval is the shortest amount of interval in the Western world. We are going from a C to a C sharp, meaning when we have a C and we put a sharp on it, our notation goes up a half step rather than having our C note uh, we have uh. The next note after a C sharp is a D. Uh. If we follow this in order, we would find that C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. The intervals that arise from this we call a P8 or an octave. Hence, C to C is an octave. We can do this with every single chord. If you've watched my channel or you're one of my students, you realize I use my hands a lot to talk about the circle of fifths. C, D, E, F, G. So when we have these five notes, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, getting rid of the six and seven and then that A through the one, and then removing your two and four gives you a one, three, five. This is the mechanism I use when I visualize the C major, giving me the chord of C major of C, E, G as my one, shifting over D, F, A, shifting over E minor, E, G, B, then F, A, C for F major, uh, G, B, D, E, G, B, and then B, D, F. Notice none of those had sharps or flats. So when we take this mechanism and we see that kind of the most important notes that we're going to be looking at look like this, generally, this is what we look for when sight reading. Our idea is we want to sight read from the bottom up and realize that this C note goes to its third and then its fifth. I wrote an A, but I thought a G. <laughs> uh, so C, E, G, that's our third. The reason why we do circle of fifths is it helps us keep centered. So let's say we're playing a song progression. Grab our guitar. If you have a little instrument, play it with me. Uh, we're just going to play the key of C major right here. C. Yeah, that's too much of a speech. <laughs> C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor. We have our B diminish, and then we have our C again. Now there are alternate chords we can play. You don't have to play your C, D, you can play your E up here. You know, you can play your F here. You can keep going up the fretboard, but for just this, we're standing underneath the five if you're playing along. What I'm gonna play right here is just a progression. A minor to E minor. F major. It's repetitive. So in my mind, the way that I would think about this would be to chart it. I could write it out on the grand staff, or I could use these notes in notation to write a quick chart so I remember it. That was in 4-4, so I put the tempo. We'll talk about that in other videos. We've talked about it a little bit in these videos. 4-4, uh, our next kind of thing is we write the notes. Well, the note I played was an A minor, so it's a minor six. You can even write a little A minor underneath here if you're looking to play these and remember them. When you go to your next chord, which in this case was an E minor, we went to the minor third. So I write the minor third, heck yeah. I could even put a little E underneath there and a little hyphen or a dash. Um, that denotes a minor in jazz. I close my measure. These are all four beats. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. When I get to the end here, I wanna repeat, because we did it twice. 
When I put the repeats on there and I have this, the next chord we went to was the four chord. I write it out, there's my four chord, and then we went to the five chord. What does this look like? Well, this looks like the beginning of using the circle of fifths to notate your own music. If you play a guitar, or you play an ukulele, or piano, or you're singing, all these things are all the same. This is what we call a progression. In this progression, it uses notations from scales. Those scales are derived from the collection of scales called the circle of fifths. That's the whole point of this. So, what we kind of want to do is learn how we can use the circle of fifths to alter or change this to add more depth and meaning to the songs we write. It also helps us for chordal analyzation and to listen to other music and try and figure out what other artists are doing that makes them so special. Once you listen to a bunch of music over and over again, the circle fifth starts to make more sense. And tell you what, if you're popping on this channel and you're watching and you have questions, jump on here, ask a question, we'll try and understand it together. Otherwise, we're just going to keep going with the circle fifths. And if you're watching this at a later time, if you do have questions, I check my channel. I'll answer them for you. Uh, so let's use this circle of fifths. Look at this. And we're not going to erase it. And what we're going to talk about right now is we're going to use the circle of fifths to go to our next key. Now, when I say next key, I just mean what has something other than no sharps and no flats? The hand mechanism I use is to say C, D, E, F, G. Can't close that hand yet. G. When we get to that G, that G has one sharp. It is the first of the chords that will have a sharp. Every time we add on an additional note from this C, which has no sharps and no flats, we go in a circle of fifths. That's why it is called the circle of fifths. As you can see, C, D, E, F, G. G major has one sharp, and that sharp is the note right before G. So when we write out G, A, B, C, D, E, and then F, we must call that an F sharp because anytime we move our triads through this whole thing to name chords, like a G major is a G B D, an A minor is an A C E, a B minor is a B D F sharp. If you do not use the F sharp in lieu of the F natural, you will achieve a chord which is only found in the key of C as the B diminished. You heard it when we explained. And that's a big difference of having a B, an F, and a D in comparison to a B, D, and an F sharp, which sounds like this. Yeah, it's still a minor chord, has that minor third, however, it doesn't have stacked diminished notes. And we'll get into explaining what these are when you stack different intervals, the differences between these. So the idea is the F sharp must have the notes that are correlating to a diminished. The F sharp is only found in the key of G or it's diatonic relative minor, E minor, meaning all the chords and all the notes for G major represent the chord structures. If we were to take this same progression we did in the key of uh, C, and we played an A minor, E minor, F major, and G, through the eyes of G major, we would be playing the minor sixth, E. We would be playing the B minor as the third. Our major fourth is a C, and our major fifth, why, that's a D. Let's hear what that sounds like the first time through, if we can remember it together. A minor. A one, two, three, four, E minor. F major. G major. A minor. E minor. F major. G major. And then when we go to play in the key of G, we're starting on the same notes that we played in C, but now it's in E, B, C, and D. E minor, B minor, C major, with a D major. Hear how the progression is the same? What we would want to do is see how we could get from maybe one of these measures and one of these key signatures, C major, no sharps, no flats, to the G major flawlessly. There's a couple of ways to get there. One of the ways I teach is called a secondary dominant. And if you enjoy these concepts, please subscribe, put something cool in the comment section. We'll get to you. Um, and then I'll answer any questions if you have them. This is on basic charting and sight reading for your chords so you can make a little progression like we just did and then hand it to somebody 
to put a couple lyrics over it, a little bit of beat, and then have fun from there. This whole concept is used through the circle of fifths, and I just want to show you and go past a little bit of what we did in the last couple sessions. So if this is our circle, not the brush drawer in the world, uh, and we have C at the top, do it with me now, C, D, E, F, G, coolness. G now has one sharp. Remember what that sharp was? That sharp was F sharp. So what we do is we start layering these. The beauty of the circle of fists is the, the sharps always go in fives too. So if you need to figure out G, the next key that has two sharps is gonna be G, A, B, C, D. Awesome, D has two sharps. One of them is gonna be F sharp, and the next one adds on, do it with me, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, B sharp, C sharp. You don't have to say the sharps, doesn't matter. F, G, A, B, C, it's five notes away. So when we do this, we get the two sharps that are now in the key of D. This has one sharp, two sharp. It keeps going around, and because all of you I know are theory buffs, <laughs> we have seven diatonic scale notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Our circle of fifths is based off of that. A couple of these are named the same, but you'll see the mechanism here. Let's just rock around the circle. Here we go. D has two. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. When we go to our next key, A, A, A has to add on D, E, F sharp, G, A. A is the new key. A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, and then our last sharp is the note right before A. So just to see this through the eyes of our mechanism, our Roman numerals, they are just giving the seniority of these special notes. So through the eyes of A major, here's what it would look like. Man, I've got some horrible handwriting. Through the eyes of A major, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Cool, what's the sharp from C? <gasps> there are no sharps left. What's the sharp from G? It's F, so we mark it. Notice how the F sharp is the note right before G. When we go to uh, D, D, G, A, B, C, D, D's our new chord. So do this with me, this is what I do with my students. Even though we have a chord structure written up here, use your brain to imagine what it would be to have this as D. This is the one, then the two, three, four, five, six, seven. When we do this, we're able to imagine different chords over the top of a chord we're looking at. It gives a little bit of symmetry to the brain and you'll see chord patterns arise out of this after doing it for a while. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. And then lastly, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp. The note right before A is going to be a G sharp. Awesome. So when we move on through our circle of fifths here, we see that the next note is going to be an E. And then after an E, we have a B. And then we have an F sharp, mainly because over here, we've got our F, which has one flat. Notice how the circle of fifths goes this way and it adds on our sharps. Each time we go through, it goes through five. So the sharp that's added on in E is gonna be the note right before E, D sharp. The note that's in B is the note right before B, so it's gonna be an A sharp. The note that is right before F sharp, right here, is an F. So what we have is, when we add and layer these on, you can see how the next note changes. A, B, C, D, E. This E sharp is an F natural. Until you see the circle of fifths, it doesn't really make sense that those two naturally occurring half steps in the key of C, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, E to F is the three to four, and then in a natural scale, or the major scale, Ionian, this modus, you would have two half steps, the three and four, or the seven to one. The resolution note, or the minor or major note, the median, deciding where it's going, up to the perfect fourth. The next note we add on after here is another weird one. What's the note right before our last sharp, which is C sharp? Well, what's the note right before C? Sharp. C, because it's in betwixt, right? So that C, when we say this, it has to be a B sharp. 
And here, here's the reason, reason why, why. When, when talk talking to you, you, I, I don't, don't say, say things twice, twice. If I was going to say, say things twice, twice, it would lose, lose a lot, a lot of meaning, meaning. So when I say, say stuff, stuff, I don't say A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, A flat. It really wouldn't make sense to have two things that are called the same thing. There are only seven notes. They need to be called accordingly. There are a few special circumstances in music where there are contradictions to what seems rational, but they always can be explained. <laughs> there are wrong answers in music and music theory, however, the long and short of it is there are always multiple answers to the same thing through the eyes of perspective and constants. Okay, so this concludes what we're gonna be doing here for the circle of fifths, and here's the correlation I wanted to make today. When you're using the circle of fifths, this could help you as a tool for writing. Not only are most of your minors interchangeable, but you can start utilizing different chords and different ideas and concepts that are based off of the different modes. So before we get into modes, which is next week, <laughs> I'd like to talk about just how the circle of fifths can be used to write those progressions and see how we could have the first of our two modus which are naturally occurring inside of the major scale. So once again, if we've got C, G, D, A, E, B, F sharp, or G flat, and then C sharp, the other way around that has the flats on it would be called the circle of force. When we go this way, circle of force. When we go this way, circle O fifths. This way produces the sharps. This way produces the flats. The difference between a sharp and a flats, these two accidentals, is that it helps us to go one way in music or the other. If you play a little bit of piano, what you'll notice is when you play more than one octave, if you go from a root note, let's say C, C, D, E, F, G, ascending up the scale, you would have a perfect fifth, C to G. That's what we would call an interval of a perfect fifth. When we go the opposite direction and do a perfect fourth the other way, it also gives us a G. Meaning, when you go in an ascending fashion, it's a fifth. And when you go in a descending fashion, it is a perfect fourth. They are relative to each other. Most of these flippity floppities, our major thirds, our minor thirds. When we throw in augmented seconds, you can see how when you play one series of intervals, they have a position. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. If we were to alter any of them, we would be taking a note outside of the position of let's say C major, which is F, C, G, D, A, E, and B. There are no sharps and flats in the key of C. So all of our notes would be the major one, the minor two, the minor three, major four, major five, minor six, and then we have our diminished. The way and mechanism we do that is we kind of visualize a little box around this. And this gives you what we would call the Ionian mode. The Ionian mode can be shifted. And the concept behind this is when we do the circle of the fifth and then progressively do the circle of force, we would see that the next note that we achieve is the B flat. After that, if we keep going in four, F, G, A, B, so it's B flat, B, C, D, E, so it's E flat. E goes to A flat because it's four notes away. E, F, G, A, A flat, A, B, C, D, D flat. Boo, doo, doo, doo. Boo, doo, doo, doo. Then do a G flat, and lo and behold, we find our way to the seventh, which has all seven flats. So when we have C flat, we say C flat, D flat, E flat, F flat, G flat, A flat, B flat, C flat. And I know it seems weird in the beginning, Blah. But when you say this over and over and over again, and then you apply it to what you're doing, no matter what your instrument is, you start to hear the differences. So if we had this concept, and this is basically, majors are right here. Our next grouping of three are all of our minors in the chord. And then the last one in the train is gonna be the diminished. When we shift this over, and then we add that note. I have shifted over a mechanism in my circle of fifths. This now correlates to the B flat. Now, if we remember, how many sharps and flats did the key of C have? Not a one. So when we're playing these chords, we tend to hear 
are diminished, that chord that sounded really funky, it has a minor third stacking. It's like our T do. It's a great resolution feeling. The other resolution is called a backdoor resolution. Rather than using the B natural, we use the B flat. Now this correlation, it happens to be a mode called mixolydian. We can use this B flat over a B7, which or a, a C7. We could use it over a G7. We could use over an F7, an A7. The idea is when we remove one of our other octaves, let's say in the key of uh, C, C major, remove the other C because all chords are triads, C, E, G. When we remove one of the C and add the seventh, we get the natural seventh. This is C major seven, which includes a C, E, G, and now a B natural. If I put that back and then include the B flat, which is right here, we now achieve some chord called a B flat. So the circle of fifths would say to us, if we're gonna be playing through here and our chords now would be represented to having a B flat, that alters the tone of every chord that we play. You could choose to do it for every chord, which would naturally alter those tones and give you a whole new scale and a modus. Or you could do it for just the last one as your resolution, as I aforementioned. C major, D minor, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, B flat major, C. It's still a resolution of sorts, except it's not a T, Do, half step. It's a whole step. Ta, Do. It goes in fashion that you'll start hearing these when you start singing these out loud with your instrument. So one of the things that I want to do is show this correlation. What we saw was how the circle of fourths is all of our flats, are all of our flats. How the circle of fifths is all of our sharps. They are all those sharps. When we take this away and we do a simple mechanism of, hey, did we learn what our sharps and flats are in the key of G? Oh, we absolutely did. Well, what is the mechanism? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then one again. I don't like writing the octave because I know it's the octave. You know it's the octave. <gasps> In the key of G, we've got G major. We have A minor. We have B minor. We have C major, D major, E minor, and then our only sharp, F sharp diminished. When we write out all of these notes and chords, we would do our triads. Now, do them with me if you're at home right now. If you're watching this later, get a piece of paper, write it down. Repetition is really how this happens. Uh, when we do the repetition over and 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 over, it really changes the way that we feel about what we're doing. Check this out. G, B, D. Why is the spelling of a G major, a G, B, D? Because the notes that are correlated inside here are represented in triads, thirds. They're a grouping of tone clusters. So our first thing that we need to talk about is a note. When we have a note, we're talking about a single tone. If we're talking about the note of G, we would have this tone and it would be on the G line, on the treble clef. If you had the bass clef, it would be on the bottom line of the bass clef <coughs> or the uh, top space of the bass clef. We're just focusing on this top higher note so we could have a little sing register here. Here's our uh, G. Uh, that is that note. It's a frequency. Uh, it has a peak and it has a trough. The top part is where it maxes out and the bottom part is where it maxes out. Uh, when we go up a perfect eighth, meaning when I go all the way from G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G to the top line right here, This is called a P8. The note that you hear from here uh, uh, that note hits the same peaks, but now the wavelength has been doubled in oscillations. Meaning, when you play chords that are not from the same note, they go over the top of each other in different institutions and correlations and what you're hearing is the point on which those notes correlate to each other and cause tension in your ear, generally at the peaks and the troughs. What happens when you see chords that are layered or stacked? Those are what we call harmonies. 
And aforementioned, the P8 is a perfect union. The one that we know the best in our mind is called the P5, which is the perfect fifth. In music, if the perfect fifth is not there, our brain naturally just kind of hears it. <laughs> it puts it in there for us. Very, very fun, very, very interesting. When we play this middle one, it's called the median. It is the one that determines whether a chord is major or minor. So seeing that there is only one sharp in the key of G, all the triads need to correlate with that. So the next three would be A, C, E. This chord represents a pitch that is above, centered on the space above the G on the A, and then moving in the space fashion. Notice how this has been lined up to be an A minor, and there's only one thing that's wrong with this perception right now. We haven't hit it yet, but we have an F natural. It doesn't account for our key signature. So we must take our sharp and put it on the F line. These have a certain specific way, F, C, G, D. They go through a process where you go up and down on these notes. But what I would like you to see today is all of this means nothing unless you know that when you're stacking these, they're played together as if they were chords. These two chords sound like this. These are half notes. This isn't a measure. We're just going to assume that there are four counts in this measure <laughs> because there are two half notes. Otherwise, it would be an incomplete or an uh, improper measure. X out. Uh, G, B, D, A, C, and E. So a G, B, D, G major, A minor. The next one's going to be B minor. And as you can probably guess, it's going to go directly from this chord to the next measure if we would. We could just draw it in an awesome new color. Purple, the color of majesty. Hey. So when we go up, guess where the B line is? It will be the middle line right here. We have to follow suit for our stacked triads, which means you're going to skip a line. I'm sorry, skip a space. Play a line. Skip a space and then put a line. Now, I know that looks funky. My line should be a little lower, but in theory, those are stacked. I have a horrible time drawing. I do apologize. So as you can see, what we're doing is we're going up the number line. What does this mean? That means that all the notes that we just chose for the B minor, B, D, and F, have to have the correlation. So we don't need to write the sharp in. It's already in the key signature. That's what this does. B, D, F, C, E, G, D, F sharp, A. And the correlation with this is D is a major in the key of G. In the key of C, it's the second, C, D. Well, the second is a minor. D, F, A is a minor chord. When we play our D, F, A, let's say we wrote it down here and we put it below here, put it right here, and right here. That correlation means that that's a lower D than hearing just this one. Uh, da, 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 da. Would be down here in the bass register, right? On the middle line of the bass clef. And just a little something. The landmark series that I'll talk about next week when I talk about the introduction to modes, we'll talk about how to use both of these clefts tied together, both staffs that we connect and we call them the grand staff. The space between might seem like an eternity, but it is not. It is absolutely. The F clef is the same way that we made the G clef. We got rid of the top here and we found ourselves having the top clef that we generally, generally read in Western music is the treble clef. The bottom clef that we generally read in Western music is going to be called the bass clef. When we see the bass clef, it looks like that, like a smiley face or a sad face going sideways. There are some people that can draw really well. They make them look something like that. Which sometimes they have little curls here. So super cute. The only thing I want to say here is if you don't know that this bass clef is called the F clef, here's how I remember. I just draw two silly lines to the two dots. That reminds me that this is the F line. If we need, we can work that F line right up F goes to G, then to A, then to B. Well, this line right here, when we see it from F, G, A is the top line, B is the space right above the top line, and then this little ledger line, which is the top ledger line above the bass clef, is the exact same note as the ledger line that is below the treble clef. They are one in the same. There is not a huge gap in betwixt this. It is just that space. So the concept is if you do this daily and write down these things, write out yourself a five line staff, put bars on the end to make it into a measure, 
count out a rhythm, even if it's 3-4, you can realize that the notation you're using might not work in a program of software that you're using. This is the reason why. Notations have to be specific. You use them over and over again, and you get to the point where you see how the melodies start to derive themselves out of the notes that we use here. The last little thing I want to do is just finish up on this E, G, B, and then our F sharp diminish is an F sharp, skip the G, go to the A, and then we have skip the B, go to the C. When we write out these notes and notation or chords, if we're trying to put it for a guitar, ukulele, saxophone, we have to bear in mind that some instruments are not in concert pitch. The circle fifths also really helps with that. If you are a clarinet player or a French horn player or a saxophone player, it doesn't matter what uh, type of woodwind you got going on there, or flute player, they're in different pitches, relative keys. Like the saxophone, the alto is in a key called E flat, which means if somebody says, hey, we're playing, uh, you know, along the watchtower, Dave Matthews, and Dave plays it in A rather than C sharp or E. Uh, so A minor, G major, F. I can't just go to a saxophone and play an A, mi a minor note or just the A note and have it work. What I need to do is transpose. For the saxophone, you'd be going up a sixth and then making it into a major. So if they're in the key of A, G, F, A, G, F, well, those three chords are in the key of C. They're also in a couple of other things, but we'll call it in the key of C major. Uh, when playing in the key of C major of that, we would be playing the sixth, the fifth, and then the fourth. Yeah, let me just give you an example. Um, a minor, G major. Dave, I think different keys. Uh, oh, no, watchtower. Foot five. When doing this A minor, G major, and F, you're playing a minor six, major fifth, major fourth. So when you tab it and write it out in chords, you can show it in that fashion using the circle of fifths. The scales that we would use would be all the notes from that key. So the key would have been A minor. Well, A minor, you can use your A minor pentatonic. You can use your C major pentatonic. You can also use your C major scale in its entirety. Sometimes you might want to change some of the notes inside of there to exhibit modes, which is why we're going to talk about it next week. And then kind of make it so it's not like a mystery. If you started naming all the modes and all the different names, you would get kind of crazed out. There's like 49 different examples of it. You can name each mode of each mode something different. <laughs> so like if you're playing a natural minor, which would be in this case an E. Where's an E? Uh, uh, if you played your natural minor and you wanted to play that from a different position, let's say the G, you would call that Phrygian dominant. <laughs> the reason being is the distance between that would be a major third, which isn't representative in many other things. Uh, the long story short is there are a lot of ways to phrase these modes, a lot of ways to talk about these scales, but they just don't really matter. What does matter is that you know the originals. Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Uh, that you just know the original one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. When working on your scales, you could actually go through the process of hearing those do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do's, writing them out and seeing how to stack notes in notation. And it doesn't happen overnight. You need to do it every day for five minutes. And if you do for a year, you will realize you can pick up any book of music, go to the first measure, read what the key signature is, what the time signature is, and then you can go through the process of getting a little feel for that. Um, it does help to have like a book, a method book, if you want. There are many different resources out here. Every single one of these chords for every single instrument that you would probably want to play, uh, saxophone, clear nut, I mean, I'll work on sitar later. <laughs> but we've got bass notes out there, guitar notes, piano structures. I work from a couple different books, the Daily Ukulele, the Ukulele Fake Book. There's thousands of songs to have fun with. And if it's for another instrument, as we were before mentioning, you can transpose using this circle of fifth. Hey, Tom, you have any music questions today? You working on anything? And the last little thing that I want to leave in this video, this lots of fun, and I really hope that those of you out here that have been kind of struggling with music theory or understanding this or using mechanisms, I hope this one is the one that sticks, that really helps you to understand what notes are in each scale because they're super awesome and important. When we go through G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, how many notes are there in a scale? There are seven. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. When we use the circle of fifths, 
I only really teach the circle of fifths so you can look at these chords going around and having purpose. When we see these chords as being mere opposites, we can start making some music together. These notes that we have over here, if you don't know how to find them, don't worry about it at first. I have a mechanism that you're going to really enjoy to see. To see. How many sharps are in the key of G? One. Great. How many notes are there in a scale? There are seven. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. The only note in G that's a sharp is the F. So remove it. That gives you six notes. When you flatten a key, it changes it a half step down. Meaning, if you know how many sharps are in the key of G, the one, you would then know that there are six flats in the key of G flat. The only note that is not a flat in the key of G flat is the one note that was a sharp. Let's do it in another key. Now that we got this circle of fifths, don't have a song you're working on? No worries. Tell you what, if you pick one off the channel, there's a lot of songs on this channel. I know that a lot of them are old doo wop classics, but that's what I like playing. And that's an easy way to learn how to sight read as well. Uh, let's go to another key. How about the key of B? B. All right, well, let's go through our sharps. C as none. G as one. What is that sharp? That sharp is F sharp. Why? It's the note right before G. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G. When we go to D, G, A, B, C, D, there are two sharps in the key of D. One is F sharp, the next one is C sharp. How do we know it's C sharp? C sharp is five notes from F, F, G, A, B, C. That's why the circle fifths works. Eventually, you just memorize there's one in G, it's F sharp. Two in D, one of them, two of them. A has three, F sharp, C sharp, and now G sharp. Why? A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp. The note right before A has to be sharpened for the new key. Therefore, when we see ourselves going down to B, B has five sharps. That fifth sharp is an A, the D from E. Those five sharps need to be represented here. B, C sharp, D sharp, E, F sharp, G sharp, A sharp, then B. When we do this, it gives us our B major, C sharp minor, D sharp minor, E major, F sharp major, G sharp minor, A sharp diminished. So no matter what instrument you're playing on, you can use these to correlate B, D sharp, and F sharp as being your B sharp major. C sharp minor, D sharp minor. Our triads are based off of seeing them as integral parts of a system of arranged notes that are correlated in a system that you could discern what they are by seeing them in different places. If we had a structure that used our B and then all these flats, some of these flats can be enharmonically changed. A B flat is an A sharp. An E flat, right, is a D sharp. An A flat, you guessed it, can you see it? Where's our A? A flat's right here. So when we see an A flat, it's a G sharp. This is the process under which we see all of our different enharmonics. So when we draw out our circle of fifths, and we do our Ionian mode, we get our major chords together, which would be B, D, and F sharp. Here's our B, here's our E, here's our F sharp, sorry, I meant uh, E. Major chords B, one, four, and five, B, E, and F sharp, they're right next to each other. Here's this one on the outside. All those are major, the next three are gonna be your minors, so you've got your C sharp, You've got your G sharp, you got your D sharp, and then the last one is going to be the diminished. This is how I use the circle of fifths to see what chords are in each key and then how to transpose it. Since we know that B major has five sharps, how do I know how many flats are in the key of B flat if I didn't already know that there's two? Well, you would write out your B C, D, E, F, sharp, G, and A. All those that had sharps, you just now make naturals. Remember our accidentals, sharps, flat, or natural. Any note that did not have a sharp now becomes a flat. 
thusly, if you have seven notes in a scale and B major had five of them, when you flatten it, B flat has boop, 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 two flats. That's why learning the circle of fifths is an easier process than you think. You only really need to learn the sharps to say, cool, A major has three sharps. There are seven notes in a scale. So if three of those were in A major, four flats must be in A flat. That's the way I learned how to do it. That's the way uh, somebody showed me, I think, or I made it up. Don't know. I've been using it for quite a while now, and it's definitely helped me. Always learning the chords off of the charts really got to me. Um, book work, reading stuff. But now that I do it all the time, every day, it has become easier and better. If you have any questions on how to sight sing, how to use your voice internally with your guitar, your ukulele, your piano, um, I'm doing a series on ear training and vocal training. Maybe check it out. It might help you with a couple things or add a couple terms into your tool bag, which will make it easier to maybe understand other channels talk about the same kind of nonsense we're doing here. I'll tell you what, if anybody has a dying question, I would love to answer it. If not, I'm probably just going to wrap this up with a couple vocab terms that we had went over. And then uh, field a couple questions and get on out of here. Got to teach today. Well, I get to teach today. Very exciting. Um, how about this? How about something that's off of the subject or on the subject? This might be kind of weird because there's not really anybody watching, but Tom, I hope you like this. Have you ever heard anybody talk about negative harmony? When we use our circle of fists, we can take the notes that we know, like our C, our G, our D, E, B, um, we can do our F sharp, sure. If we go this way, F, B flat, um, E flat, A flat. See how we're just going out this amount of numbers and each one of these has a systematic way of going through these. These are called negative harmonies. So when we're in a specific key, we can alter our chord structures by using these. This concept called negative harmony is kind of fun. I use negative harmony with a concept called mirror modes. And when we use a certain mode, all the different scales that we use have a way of going like, remember how we drew out this and this was our C major, majors, one, four, five, minors, this is going to be our two, this is going to be our um, three, and then this is our diminished, the last one. Three majors, right, if we move it for the dominant chord, but when we keep it here we have our three majors, three minors, right, oh we don't have our A do we? Beep, beep, beep. Sorry about that. Do, 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 do. I was wondering why I looked weird. So, the idea with this is all of our notes have relative and negative structures that we could work. When we use this in correlation, if you're writing a chord song or you've got a, a different phrasing that you're trying to look for, like let's say we're playing just a song that has a couple different measures. It's going uh, maybe G, D, A minor, E minor. Well, this obviously is either in the key of C or it's in the key of, no, it's in the key of G because D major is fifth. So if we're writing this out, this is our little thing. We're doing this over and over. We're just repeating it, you know, 1,200 million times. <laughs> uh, this could be a good way to have a lot of fun playing, but if you wanted to switch it up just a little bit, you could swap out one of the notes of your relative major or minor from here. Since this is in the key of G, we'd have G, A, B, C, D, E, and then our F sharp. Well... When we were doing this, we noticed that we had our C, G, D, like that, around our circle fist. The other way was this way, right? If we go out two places, our B flat actually can be swapped out for our D. It does make sense that some of these negative harmonies and the way we see them are also very closely related to our relative minors, but they're not always the case for having a B minor here. You don't necessarily need to have a B minor. You could have a B major seven if you wanted, it would alter the way that this is going to sound. And then inevitably, you would be able to play some different chords off of this. If you share a measure, it would make sense that you're using something. This would be a D Ionian. 
this would be a B aeolian mode. The modal structures that we use off of here are close to these, but in the key of G, we don't use B as the aeolian mode, do we? We use E minor, because that is the six. G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp. So Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, Locrian. When we use this, yeah, it makes sense in the key here, but since you're playing this small phrasing here, these two are relative to each other, so why not try both? That's what we're gonna talk about next week on modes, on how to see inside of structures. When you're playing out a chord structure, maybe want to changing up something if you're playing it 12 times for your rhythm. Maybe the A section that you have sounds this way, and then the B section that you have takes the same kind of construct, but then it uses maybe negative harmony. If we played negative harmony, our G would now go here. And what we're talking about essentially is when we look at our chords, when we write them out, if you had a G major, G, B, D, if I wanted to see these on the complete opposite, I could tab out what these are and see the complete opposite of the note. Sometimes making it the, its polar opposite, like G major to G minor, doesn't make sense in one key signature. But if you tonicify it into another key signature, that change of dropping the median to a flat, making a minor, would immediately move it to another key, transposing it. The ear sometimes doesn't want to hear those changes. And what what we try to do with these modes is make it melodic enough that it causes an emotion. These modes are supposed to invoke that emotional response. And we just want to talk those in the next series. Next series for the modes, we'll cover a little bit more of the circle fifths. It's going to cover on how to chord chart some of these different movements, how to start writing your own music down so you, one, can remember it. Two, you could give it to other people so they can play it as well. And then three, Heck, maybe even record it, put it on out there so you have a fun time uh, getting the experience of getting songs out on Spotify, sheet music, and writing your own notation. Uh, it's something else. Other than that, I really enjoyed doing this one again. Every time that I teach, I learn something new. Every time we answer questions, we actually become the teacher and the student. If you have questions from watching this and you're watching it in the future, please put them in the comment section. I will watch my comments and get back to you. If I don't know the answer, I'll ask my teachers to see what we can come up with. Anywho, if you're in Hilo, stop by Big Island um, Guitars. Give them some love. They're the music store into which I rent a room from. There are several other guitar teachers and other instrument teachers here. So check it out if you're in town very short time. Learn how to play an instrument. Or just pop by and say hello. Other than that, Tom, it was good seeing you today. Be well. And everyone else, have an awesome day. My friend, my friend.